when I was doing the research of some of the top words of 2020, here are some of uh, the words that I found. Coronavirus, COVID-19, quarantine, asymptomatic, social distancing, vaccinations and stuff like that. So it, it, I guess a lot of us are uh, researching about the topic and uh, and some of us, if you're like me, are probably uh, self-proclaimed experts on the topic. Uh, in order for me to kind of understand the topic much better, understand viruses better and how vaccines work, I decided to speak to an expert. So today we are with um, Dr. Lalita Parmeshwaran, who is um, an expert in the infectious diseases space. So firstly, Lalita, welcome and uh, you know, thank you for taking the time. So can we start uh, by you just giving us a brief of uh, who you are and what you do, Lalita? Sure, Agnil. Uh, so I am an infectious disease doctor, and uh, I also work in vaccine research. Uh, and I've been doing some research uh, for the coronavirus uh, vaccines. So that's in a short uh, sort of answer. That's, that's who I am. And uh, it's so interesting you mentioned the top research words. Would we have even imagined where we would be in 2018, for example? This is where we are. So it's really remarkable how our internet searches have changed over time. So I'm happy to do this interview. Thank you very much for having me on your uh, YouTube channel. Thank you, Lalita. So let's start with the basics, right? So what is the difference between a virus and a bacteria? Okay, wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked because this is the commonest mistake most people make is merging the two. They're entirely two different species, literally. So uh, bacteria are things that are bigger. Uh, they can be seen with a regular microscope. They have certain properties such as the cell wall. They can uh, survive in uh, different types of condition. And you need a certain amount ingested into your body uh, to cause medical problems. Viruses are very different. They are essentially non-existent outside the human host or outside another type of host. So they need the protein, they need the building blocks of the other host's um, body to really survive and replicate. And they're extremely contagious, much more than bacteria are. So uh, they cannot be seen through a, you know, just a regular microscope. Most of them need electron microscope and they look quite benign. They even look cute when you take pictures of them. Like you might have seen the fuzzy looking coronavirus balls going around, yes. you know. So, uh, you know, something so deadly looks very cute. So uh, it's hard to uh, explain. Uh, each virus uh, does not have the same appearance. You know, they all look different. But that's the basic difference between the two. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I I always wanted um, a real life version of the of the coronavirus so that I could play with it because it, it is really cute, Lita. So I I do agree. So uh, a couple of other what questions, right? So um, what is the immune system? Okay, our immune system is uh, is complex. So it's something that has matured uh, from childhood to adulthood, and it has many layers. Um, so in our human body, we go through uh, meeting a lot of foreign material. We meet viruses, we meet bacteria, we meet parasites, we meet environmental toxins almost on a daily basis. And we don't fall ill from it. This is because our immune system has an inbuilt array of mechanisms to really destroy all of these things and prevent them from attacking you. So the, you know, to break it down, the immune system is largely made up of lymphocytes and neutrophils and some other allergy uh, responding, uh, those cells that respond to allergies such as eosinophils. So for the purposes of this particular talk, we are going to talk mostly about lymphocytes, which are mainly responsible for immunity against viruses. So the lymphocytes are of two types, B cells, which produce your antibodies, and T cells, which are responsible for long-term mm -hmm. immunity and much more powerful immunity. They have memory. So in childhood, if you were exposed to chick chicken pox, you know, the ch T cells will have the memory. So if you encounter chicken pox again, it's very unlikely you're going to get the disease. However, the virus, as you know, the chicken pox virus lives in your nerve cells and can reactivate and produce a disease called shingles. So uh, the T cells keep it in check. And then when you are under periods of extreme stress, it can pop up. So 
the T cells are basically responsible for keeping your body healthy. They're most active when you're very young. So kids have an organ called thymus in their neck, which is germinating beautiful new T cells. And it's made this way because kids encounter the most microbes compared to an adult. Like when you see a toddler, what does it do? It wanders all over the place and puts everything in its mouth. Yes. That's how, that's how it gets exposed to all these foreign antigens. So there's some theory that the more sterile your environment is, you know, the less likely your kid is going to be exposed to all these foreign antigens. So nature designed it so that kids get immune to a lot of things when they're very young and gave the kids an organ which atrophies in your older age. So your older, you know, older person is not necessarily going to be able to mount a very good response to in response to a foreign antigen. And you can see that play out in the coronavirus pandemic. What is a vaccine? Okay, a vaccine is, um, is a method by which you educate your immune system to respond appropriately and correctly to, uh, uh, you know, to a real life infection. So what I mean by that is you take small amounts of the pathogen you're trying to, you know, get immunity from and you introduce it with some sort of a shell um, so that what they found in research is if you don't put the shell around it, your body immediately destroys the pathogen and the immune system is not educated at all. So you put it in a little shell, you introduce it into the body, usually through the muscular injection. So slowly the pathogen gets released into the bloodstream where your immune cells are circulating around and then the immune cells encounter it and say, hey, what is this? This is something new. Let's attack it and kill it. So you're controlling the whole process by introducing a small amount, unlike a natural infection, which is uncontrolled because we cannot control how much organism is entering Mm. into your body with a natural infection. So here you're giving like 0.5 ml or 0.3 micrograms or something like that you know, and your immune system gets educated. And the next time around, when you're in a public situation and someone sneezes on you and you get a bunch of flu virus and you inhale it, then your immune system, you know, it takes a few hours and then it says, hey, you know, I've seen this before. Let's just activate and destroy. So they all marshal in and they destroy because they're all ready. They're ready to go. They've been educated before. So it's really like an exam, right? You take Mm -hmm. practice tests, and then you, you're ready to go in the exam. That's the whole sort of principle of vaccination. Yeah, I love the analogy uh, like that. It's amazing. Uh, so on that note, you know, I've heard of uh, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, AstraZeneca, I don't know, Covaxin, Sputnik V. I mean, there are so many different types of vaccines. So can you maybe, I, I guess they kind of divided into different types of categories. So can you maybe talk about the different types of uh, COVID vaccines, please. Sure. And I think the one thing to appreciate in this and, uh, you know, because of the informational blitzkrieg, I think we have lost track of this, but how remarkable is it that we have this many vaccines within a year of a brand new virus discovery? I mean, it's just unbelievable. So um, anyway, um, so there are multiple types. So the older, what I would call not necessarily the bad, you know, there's nothing, none of these, I'm not calling any of these vaccination uh, types superior from the other because some of them we don't have the information for. And uh, I would classify them in my own head as sort of the more traditional method of manufacturing a vaccine, which is, you know, the Bharat Biotech or the Sputnik. It looks like they use the inactivated coronavirus to uh, stimulate the immune system. And uh, the newer types, which are, you know, the adenovirus-based vaccine or the mRNA technology vaccine, uh, you know, are, have not been deployed at such large scales before. So the adenovirus vector vaccines are the J&J and the AstraZeneca. And they've been on, you know, in the press a lot uh, recently. But the technology is pretty solid. Uh, It has been used uh, in other viral illnesses. So it has been around a lot. uh, And clinical trials have been done uh, in these other viral illnesses like SARS-1, the original pandemic, or, you know, MERS, which is Mm -hmm. the Middle East uh, virus, which both of which didn't really become a pandemic or spread globally. Luckily, they're far more deadly, actually. Um, So... Uh, The technology, what it does is it takes a common cold virus, which is the adenovirus, and it uh, 
engineers it not to divide. So then, and then this adenovirus carries the genetic material of the spike protein in the coronavirus. So if you remember your fuzzy ball coronavirus diagram, those things which are popping out, they are the spike protein, or at least a part of them are the spike protein, and that's how it enters into the human cell. So it uses that protein to attach to the human cell and enter it. So every, you know, a lot of the vaccine technology we have available now is based on this uh, preventing this attachment because then you don't allow the virus to enter into your human cell at all. Uh, so the AstraZeneca and J&J use adenovirus technology. They use a vector, which is, you know, a substance that transports something else. It's taken up by your body, destroyed, and then the, uh, you know, the spike protein is decoded and the immune system is educated mRNA technology, what it does is it goes one step further up in protein production. So it uses mRNA, which, which carries a message as to how to produce the spike protein. And that mRNA is closed up in a, in a shell of fatty layer. So, you know, your body slowly opens up the shell and then takes up this mRNA, produces the protein, and then the um, uh, immune system gets educated that there is something foreign floating around and you know, it destroys it. So they all in some ways work very similarly. Um, that is the purpose is to educate the immune system. Amazing. Okay. So uh, it, it almost seems like there's a lot of stuff that goes into testing a vaccine, uh, Lalita. So, you know, so that it's available for uh, commercial use. So can you maybe talk about at a high level what those uh, steps are? Sure. Uh, the one thing I do want to emphasize here in this question is that despite the speed the vaccines were developed, none of the steps were cut short. And I can say this pretty confidently as a vaccine researcher that there were no steps that were cut short. So uh, usual vaccinology or usual research goes through three human uh, clinical testing phases. So the, even before the pre-human trial phase, we do tests on animals, we do cell tests, you know, they have to pass those stages. So for example, the mRNA technology has been tested for many, many years uh, over, you know, to ensure that it, it is not dangerous. Uh, it was actually a technology that was going to be deployed for the Zika virus, but then the coronavirus came and we were fortunate, really. It was, uh, you know, it was lucky. We were lucky. Uh, for example, if the pandemic had happened 10 years ago, we may not have had the mRNA technology at that time. So, uh, so there are three phases of human trials once they go through all the animal phases. Uh, there is phase one, two, and three. Phase one is safety. The most biggest, biggest point is to test it on healthy volunteers of different ages. And you make sure that your vaccine is not unsafe. So very, very rigorous, small numbers of uh, participants screened extremely carefully. And the whole intent is that you do not ever introduce a vaccine that will be harmful um, for the public. So you have to be very, very careful. In a phase one trial, you record every single thing the participant says as an adverse event almost, <laughs> because you just don't know whether they're experiencing anything in the norm, out of the norm, nobody knows, because that's the first time someone is testing. Now, phase two trial will include larger numbers of people, but they, and they will start looking at the vaccine's usefulness. Like, is it actually going to prevent the disease that it is designed to prevent? So there is two, almost two things, safety and efficacy. What we call efficacy of the vaccines is, is it working the way it is supposed to in that particular population? We don't enroll very sick people even in phase two. We enroll, uh, you know, the criteria are, little bit broader. So you have controlled diseases, for example, and things like that. Phase three is you try to stimulate uh, or simulate the real world uh, situation as much as possible. So those are your giant trials, you know, your 40,000 40, people in the Pfizer trial. So you try to simulate real world situation as much as you can. And, uh, you know, it's all about efficacy. So you want to make sure that your vaccine is working. That's your primary endpoint but you're still concerned about safety. So you have, you know, you want to make sure when you, when you introduce it in a large enough population, it works. So uh, how the coronavirus trials were speeded up is they uh, merged uh, phase two and phase three for some of them. 
and uh, they were able to make sure that they enrolled large numbers of people and uh, you know they were able to identify both safety concerns as well as efficacy concerns by enrolling large number of people. Uh, not all trials did this, just one or two you know, trials did this. So um, that was a way of speeding up. Hmm. So just so, you know, I, I just want to repeat what you said, Lalita, because uh, it's very important for listeners to kind of understand this uh, is there were no shortcuts taken and uh, just like any other vaccine was tested for its safety and efficacy, this was also tested to, uh, you know, th there were no shortcuts taken. I think that's that's very good to know and uh, uh, thank you, Lalita. So I have a curveball question for you, Lalita. So, you know, generally what I have heard and uh, what I think is common knowledge, and I could be wrong in this, is that it takes years for uh, vaccine development. So how was the healthcare community able to bring this COVID vaccine to commercial use so quickly? So some of the things I mentioned before uh, where they enrolled, I think there was tremendous level of interest uh, in enrolling for a vaccine trial, right, which was, uh, which was global. So the, there was an ongoing pandemic um, and uh, we were testing uh, vaccines based on that. We got, uh, we got lucky because the phase one trials did not show for, you know, for example, Pfizer and Moderna, the phase one trials didn't show any major safety concerns. So they were able to proceed with phase two. For example, you know, uh, a rival company of Pfizer and Moderna did not proceed with their coronavirus vaccine because they just could not get the phase one data. So it doesn't happen always that way. So it was a little bit fortuitous, mm. you know, a little bit lucky that we were able to proceed with, with these two major vaccines that are available now. And then, um, and then I told you that the phase two and phase three were merged, uh, you know, and uh, we had such a huge number of people enrolling so it was possible to do that and then there were no major safety concerns in phase one so it was again possible to do the phase two phase three together and the approval process was expedited almost in all of the country so fda takes almost six months to approve or longer uh, it tried to do it in six weeks so the approval process was short they you know, they went through the data, I mean, appropriately, because they cannot take six months to approve a vaccine when a pandemic is killing so many people. And uh, they approved it quicker. Some people even say those six weeks they take is too long. But, uh, you know, that was the fastest they could do. And it's all emergency use authorization. So it is not a full approval. It is to use in emergency. So they're still very vigilant about uh, side effects. That's why CDC has a website called VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, where you can go and report any unusual side effects from any of these vaccines. So there's still hypervigilance going on. The pause in the J&J &J vaccine reflects that hypervigilance. It's good. We need to have these pauses to make sure that uh, the vaccines are safe. Thank you, Lata. And I think I again want to reiterate the fact that there were no shortcuts taken in, in the vaccine. So uh, because I think one of the biggest challenges that we may face as society uh, is vaccine uh, hesitancy. And uh, I hope uh, this will uh, this will convince at least, you know, folks listening to this video to um, to go out there and get their vaccine. Okay. So on, on a more somber note, uh, Lalita, are we, are we done with COVID yet or uh, is there more to come? Unfortunately, my answer or what I would say is the best guess because I don't think hmm. the healthcare providers necessarily have been correct about guessing the coronavirus's behavior. Hmm. Uh, so I think my most educated guess is we are not done with it. Um, we... We will have to learn to live with it. But I believe that if kids and um, most of the population get vaccines um, available to them and to get vaccinated, then over a few years, we will see it become much more like influenza, I would say. So it will always be a deadly pathogen, but mm. it, will take, it will take some concerted effort from the society for it to become similar to influenza, which is which itself is quite bad. I think people have forgotten how bad influenza is. 
Um, whether we can ever stamp it out completely, I don't know yet. Mm. Okay, that's um, that, that's good to know. So, on that on that note, then, uh, Lalita, is what would you advise people uh, to do so that we can manage this specific uh, pandemic better? So, what I would advise is um, one, you know, it's been hard on people not to socialize. So. Mm. A lot of times the super spreader events or what we call super spreader type of, uh, uh, you know, local cluster of infections are occurring because people are indoors and socializing. So the coronavirus is mostly airborne indoors. So with, within your four walls of your home, if all the windows are closed and you're sitting with a bunch of people who are probably not vaccinated, different exposure levels, maybe there are kids running around you can anticipate that there will be some infections, especially in the people who are most, uh, um, you know, at risk. So I think you have to choose to socialize in, in a situation where people uh, practice some uh, physical distancing and also have windows open, encourage ventilation, make sure that they are all vaccinated. Don't, uh, if there are high risk people in that group, you know, wear a mask. So mask wearing pick your spot to socialize, ensure that it's well ventilated, try to control the numbers. You know, 50 people is not the same as five people. So pick whom you want to socialize with. So I think those are sort of the tenets of avoiding an infection for yourself and avoiding it for your, for example, you visit your parent and, you know, they're 70 years old, you're going to pass on this infection that you picked up in a party to them. So uh, those would be what I would suggest. So I would suggest mask wearing as, as a big, 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 um, you know, tool in this pandemic, um, not, you know, especially indoors. Um, I think people relax more indoors, so take off their masks. Uh, the second thing I would encourage is vaccination. So we do have information available now about a year from the phase one trial. So those participants so far have not shown any major safety related concerns, no, nothing really except they're doing okay. Uh, and we do have scientific data for that. So it's, it's you know, it's uh, reliable. I understand that we don't have long-term data. However, this is a pandemic. We don't have long-term data for COVID either. So no one knows if you have an asymptomatic COVID infection, coronavirus infection, how is your health going to be affected two years down the line? Nobody knows that. So I feel the uh, the pros for getting vaccinated, that alone should be, you know, should be a compelling argument, at least at this time in, you know, when it's about a year from the phase one trials. So for me, those would be the main things I would do to keep myself healthy and keep my loved ones healthy. It's, um, you make a very beautiful argument here, Lita, is for those who say that I don't know the long-term effects of vaccination, uh, we don't know the long-term effects of potentially getting the disease either, and the chances of bad or severe long-term effects once you get the disease are probably way worse than, uh, you know, maybe short-term side effect of a vaccine. So I, I think that's a very beautiful argument uh, here, uh, Lalita. So uh, another question is how likely is another pandemic of this nature in the next few decades? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we've been, <laughs> I won't say we, I, that sounds like as though I'm predicting things, but I would say the epidemiology community has been expecting a pandemic for mm -hmm. a long time, actually. Um, we thought it'd be the flu. Uh, it, you know, it's still possible flu is just lurking out there. Um, and the possibility of another pandemic, I would say, is fairly high within my lifetime. I don't know about the next 10 years, but I would say there will be another pandemic within my lifetime. Uh, the last pandemic we had was HIV in the 1980s. And then we had the flu, which most people seem to have forgotten, but it was called the swine flu, the H1N1. And it did, it, it was a pandemic and uh, that happened in 27, I think. And the good thing was we managed to figure out a vaccine and we were extremely lucky that, uh, you know, the Tamiflu or Siltamivir was still effective against swine flu. So I bet if we had a pill for coronavirus, people would feel a lot safer. 
but we don't. And uh, so I think the future pandemic is, is a high possibility just based on history. So in, in that case, uh, moving on to a slightly more positive note uh, than Lalita is what could we as humanity do to prevent it from happening? And has COVID taught us a lesson and given us a template to deal with future pandemics? So apparently the United States was the most prepared for a pandemic. We just showed that theory really does not translate into practice. Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, you know, lessons learned will, is like a little layer of, you know, gift wrapping thing that we're going to keep unwrapping. Oh, what did we do wrong? Oh, we did this wrong. Oh, we did that wrong, you know? So we did the vaccines right, but we did pretty much most other things wrong, it appears. And this is not unique to us. It's not the United States alone that did it. You know, it's all over, all globally. The cases are surging in India now, and we thought India had herd immunity a few months ago. So... Yeah, it's 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 all it's nature. You're fighting with a virus that you do not know the properties of fully yet. We still do not know why is it affecting some people very very mildly. What does that mild infection mean for you? You know, is it just mm-hmm. lurking around somewhere, and is it going to create problems two months down the line? Who knows? And then why is it affecting and creating strokes in some people? Why is it causing heart attacks in some people? Why is it causing hemorrhages in some people? So. We don't know the natural properties of the virus fully yet. Um, And we're going to keep studying it. I think uh, globally, what can we do again? We just have to respect nature and we just have to identify things faster. So, you know, wherever the pandemic originates, um, there should be surveillance systems that needs to be in place. There should be surveillance systems and labs that are doing research on viruses and creating, you know, exposing these virus, viruses to different cell lines. We need to keep tabs on these labs. And there needs to be sort of a global, uh, you know, army of investigators who should be given the power to shut down things, who should be given the power to monitor, you know, local virus rates. There needs to be like a development of such a body of people who really go into the country and investigate you know, are there bats that are harboring certain types of viruses? Are there pangolins? Are there, you know, cats? Like, who knows? So we, we, we have a very spot work surveillance system, which is not global. Um, we need to have that. We need to have it in the countries where there is a intermixing of human with animal species. Um, like, for example, the Ebola, you know, it happened when the virus jumped from monkeys to human and bats, you know, the Nipah virus in India. So they're all global pandemics waiting to happen. We need to know ahead of time. So I don't know if this is going to happen. It requires a lot of financial undertaking. It challenges the, each government's sort of independence in some ways. So I'm not sure if we will have that set up. Mm. It's, you make such a profound point, uh, Lalita, and it's got me thinking so much uh, that I, I'm just going to listen to this answer three or four times to even absorb uh, you know, some of the things that you've said because it's, it's very deep and very profound as to what could we as humanity be probably doing wrong and what could we do better as, uh, uh, as, a, you know, as, as, as human beings. So Yeah, I think it's important to note that the answer for a lot of things like this it's essentially nature that we're you know we have to track down and it's not simple it's not a quick fix and for our technology generation we need to remember that things sometimes are not quick fixes they take a long time they take time and effort yeah and um, yeah and i completely agree we live in a world of quick rewards and uh, things like that which I think we just have to sometimes reflect on ourselves as well. It's it's uh, it's amazing you say that, Lalita. So, uh, so my final question for you, Lalita, is uh, you know from a career standpoint, right? So for people who are looking to get into the infectious diseases space, what would your advice be to them? Oh, that's a really amazing question. Uh, one of my hobby horse type of like, oh, let me be asked by somebody this question, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so thank you for asking me this question. So uh, I love my field. You can probably hear it in my voice. I just, yes. I just love my field. 
And if I had to go back and pick something, I would just pick it over and over again. Uh, why do I love it so much? And I think about I think about it even from medical school. I think I just love knowing the power of these little microorganisms. And I love knowing that I can in some way help human beings uh, combat these things, you know? So the goal, I think, is not to kill everything that lives on your body. So most infectious disease doctors will tell you that we live in a state of peaceful coexistence. So these organisms that live on our skin, so our skin is covered with billions of microorganisms, fungi, that are keeping your skin healthy. In fact, if you become too sterile, that's when infections happen because there's a beautiful microbiome of these organisms covering your body. There is many more billions living in your gut and they are, res they are responsible for keeping you healthy. So my field teaches you that harmony with microorganisms is good. A harmony with nature is good. You only try to intervene when the harmony is disturbed, like a viral infection. You allow yourself to recuperate from a viral infection like a cold. Mm -hmm. But if you have something as pathogenic as coronavirus, you know you have to take precautions against it because this is not something that can be allowed to you know, go through your body and create problems. So uh, my field is, you know, that part of my field I really love. It teaches me respect. It teaches me respect to the really tiniest thing which you cannot even see through the naked eye, but has brought, to the, brought the entire globe, you know, to its knees. There is some yeah. level of respect. You have to give that organism that respect. Now, do you want to invite it into your house? That's a totally different question. You don't want it, <laughs> you don't want it in your house. That's where you go and vaccinate yourself so you can respect it from a distance. And uh, uh, that is one thing. The second thing why I chose infectious disease is because I, I wanted to cure people. It's one of the few medical specialties. So you can pick like surgery, you know, you go and cut the disease organ out, you know, you're curing that person. You can think of bone marrow transplant where you transplant, you know, a bone marrow and you kill the cancer cell forever. But besides those things, there is really not much cure going on, right? Your diabetes is maintained and controlled. Your hypertension is maintained and controlled. But pneumonia can be treated um, and cured. And I can say goodbye to my patient and hope that ne they never come back to me. That, that's my reward. So I wanted to cure people. And that was the other uh, big thing for me. So, uh, yeah, I, I think people should at least enter into infectious disease research if they're interested. Definitely being an infectious disease doctor will, is, has its challenges working nonstop in a pandemic, but it has its rewards because I know after 20 years, I'll reflect back on this experience and say, oh my God, you know, that was, those were the times and hopefully uh, we go through <laughs> to reach that 20 years, you know, so um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Lalita. So uh, there you have it. I think folks who are interested in the infectious disease space, uh, that, that's, that's what you need to be and you need to do and you need to have if you want to um, really get into that space. So uh, Lalita, thanks a lot for your time. Just before I let you go, I just want to uh, say that there are two other topics that I want to discuss with you, which is one is antibiotics and super bacteria. The other is bats. Um, I will probably block your time sometime in the next few weeks, a few months to discuss that because that is something I'm curious about and I would love to get your perspective on, uh, you know, the abuse of antibiotics and how super bacteria are being created and stuff like that. And, and on something like bats where, um, uh, you know, they, they just seem to have all the different viruses and, you know, they just walk around like, you know, they're super cool and nothing just happens to them. So uh, I really want to talk to you about both these, but, uh, before that, uh, Lalita, I just want to say thanks a lot for your time. It's been um, uh, very eye-opening for me in terms of some of the things that you've uh, that you've discussed here, and uh, you know, it, it's just great. I I just hope uh, everyone appreciates the kind of knowledge that you've that you've shared here. So thank you, Lalita. Thank you so much, Agnal. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, I just want to make sure everyone's aware. These are my opinions. <laughs> yes. Everyone's allowed to have an opinion, but, you know, they're also, uh, you know, I'm in the field. So I understand the reality a lot more. <laughs>